टुडे वी विल टॉक अबाउट समथिंग कॉल्ड क्वार पार्ट ऑन मॉडल बट बिफोर दैट आई नीड टू से फ्यू थिंग्स रिगार्डिंग पार्ट ऑन सम मोर सो वी वर लुकिंग एट इलेक्ट्रॉन प्रोटॉन डीप इन इलास्टिक स्कैटरी एंड वी सॉ दैट based on the symmetries of electromagnetic interaction this scattering cross section it depends on two functions which we called two unknown functions w1 and w2 w1 comma 2 which in principle can depend on theta and d prime d prime is the energy of the final state electron and theta is the angle the final state electron makes with respect to initial electron and uh, but these are not lorentz invariant quantities so we exchanged these two variables with the two other variables called q squared and u and then i also said that we exchange we do a further exchange that uh, we instead of these two variables we use x is equal to Minus q square by two m nu, and q square is equal to minus q square. And I gave some reasons as to why we used these funny-looking variables. And uh, if w one two are some general functions of theta. and d prime i expect w12 to depend both on x and on q square but uh, experiment showed that w12 are functions of on the x and for some reason this property is called scaling and uh, this scaling property is explained in a very simple manner in feynman's parton model the assumption <coughs> the assumptions of this model first assumption is proton consists of massless point particles which feynman called partons and two partons do not interact with each other by the way the this is the second assumption is a totally crazy assumption if partons are not interacting with each other how are they bound together in proton that's a question feynman completely disregarded <coughs> but 
based on these two assumptions and of course there is a third assumption that is say a part term carries a fraction xi of proton momentum and this is what I showed in the last class that if you do out if you calculate the hadronic tensor based on these assumptions you will find that the hadronic tensor is proportional to and uh, so any general this is hadronic tensor of partons so the hadronic tensor for proton is integral 0 to 1 dz f of z h alpha beta So, I assume there is a part term with momentum xi p and I calculate the hadronic tensor for it and now I ask what is the probability of finding that part term with momentum fraction xi in proton. That probability density I call f of xi. And so this is the hadronic tensor for parton. This is the probability of having such a parton. So I multiply it and integrate over all possible values of that. And that should give me the hadronic parton tensor. Rather, the hadronic tensor, not hadronic parton tensor, that's a sort of contradiction in terms so to speak that gives me the proton tensor and because of this whatever I get is going to be a function of x. So that is Feynman's explanation. This raises two questions. Question number one, are partons rather What is the spin of the partons? Mind you, in the expressions I wrote down last week, which I copied from Cheng and Lee, I wrote those expressions using the fact that the partons are spinners. But on the other hand, if you recollect, the derivation of where this delta function came from that came purely from kinematics. It didn't depend on the tensor structure. There was a delta function integration and that delta function integration taking into account all the kinematic details gave me this delta function. So, I get this delta function whether the part term is spin 0, spin 1, spin 2, whatever. Uh, 
So question one is what is the spin of the part? And uh, second question, this whole thing is from deep inelastic scattering of electrons on protons. And uh, the assumption we made is electron emits a off shell photon with a very large Q square. And this off shell photon, which nominally has a very small de Broglie wavelength, is probing inside the proton, reaching very small wavelengths. So, probing the internal structure of the proton. And it is hitting one of these point like particles and that is what is generating this deep inelastic scattering. This nature of point like is important because what we are talking here is if you have a 5 GeV electron to make it change its direction you need tremendous amount of force. To generate that tremendous amount of force, if it is coming due to electromagnetic interactions, let's think classically here for a minute, the charges are fixed. So the only way the, you can push the force is if you reduce the distance between them. Now, if the scattering target has a finite size with charge spread over it, you can't get, gain the force by reducing the r in 1 over r square. Only if the particle is point like, then you can take limit almost r as non-zero but as small as you want and that will give rise to this very large force. So it is capable of pushing a 5 GeV electron off course. This is a slightly hand waving argument but I mean, there is a kernel of truth there. So if you go to higher and higher energies and you find the projectiles are getting scattered at large angles. It means that the projectile is getting arbitrarily close to the scattering center and the scattering center has smaller and smaller size. Only then the projectile can get arbitrarily close to the scattering center. <laughs> So one of course is what question one is what is the spin of partons and question number two whatever we have talked about it's the whole picture is built to explain deep inelastic scattering which means that whatever partons are participating in this formalism they are electrically charged. Only if the parton has electric charge is it capable of absorbing this off shell photon. If the parton doesn't have electric charge, it cannot, it, can, it doesn't interact with the photon. So, the fact that this picture works means there are electrically charged partons, but question is, are all partons electrically charged. So these are the two questions that I will try to answer.
in so, uh, in what, today's class. Yeah. What about uh, what is the charge of individual part one? That will come late. By the way, uh, I mean, I will I will answer this question. In order to answer, or uh, I should hear what spin of charge no, no yeah of uh, charge quartons or uh, i'll by visible i mean those which are interacting with this off shell photon and equivalently you can call them charge quartons <coughs> this question i can answer without referring to any further assumptions we can answer this question within feynman parton model plus experiment whereas to answer this question we need to make some assumptions in particular the question that you asked what is the electric charge of the part So, to answer this question, we look at the tensor structure of the partonic tensor. So, this H alpha beta parton, it has Here, sigma is the initial possible spin of the parton. I don't know whether the parton has spin or not, but I, I assume the possibility and that's why I put a sigma and similarly sigma prime is the possible spin of final parton. Anyway, I'm going to sum over all the spins. So, Strictly speaking, the label sigma and sigma prime, they don't matter. And uh, xi p is the momentum of the initial parton and p prime is the momentum of the final parton. And this electromagnetic current that is generated by this off-shell photon takes me from the initial parton to final parton and this is the complex conjugate of that and the product of these two is what gives rise to the hadronic tensor of, uh, <coughs> of the part arm. Now, if partons are spin zero, Then we look in some standard textbook and see how a photon couples to a sca charged scalar particle and we see that In the case of a scalar, there are no gamma matrices, so the electromagnetic current it has to be a vector and the only vectors available to me are 
P and T prime. And the gauge invariance requires that they should appear in this combination. And remember there is a energy momentum conserving delta function which means P prime is xi P plus Q. So this is 2 xi P plus Q times beta. <laughs> and which means that H alpha beta is 2 xi P plus Q times alpha plus xi p plus q times beta and the important thing to know is there is no g alpha beta in this tensor there is p alpha p beta q alpha q beta and then the symmetric part p alpha q beta dot 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 but there is no g alpha beta Whereas, if part terms are spin half, then is u bar p prime gamma beta u psi p there is also sigma sigma prime sigma which i didn't explicitly put or okay let me not be lazy and put them also And when I multiply it by its conjugate and uh, take the sum over the spins, I have the standard uh, trace formula and all of those things that I apply. And when I do that, you will find that this comes out to be After sum over spins, this comes out to be, there are additional kinematic factors which I have dropped in the discussion so far, but they are all there in the discussion given in Cheng and Lee. So, 4 m square psi square times P alpha P beta by M square minus M nu by G alpha beta. So now you see that there is a P alpha P beta term, but there is also a G alpha beta term. And uh, so the H alpha beta spin half part on has the form delta xi minus x times psi by nu p alpha p beta by m square minus 1 over 2 m g alpha beta and and 
if I write H alpha beta proton is equal to integral 0 to 1 d psi f of psi h alpha beta parton of spin half I will get x f of x by mu p alpha p beta by mu square minus f of x by m g alpha beta Now, I ask you to sort of look at the very first lecture where we defined this proton hadronic tensor. We used the concept of Lorentz covariance, parity and gauge invariance to write down this tensor and said that there are two functions minus g alpha beta times w1 plus p alpha minus p dot q by q square q alpha p beta minus p dot q by q square q beta times w2. I hope you remember this. This is, I, we did this in the very first class. So, comparing these two, the coefficient of g alpha beta is related to w1 and coefficient of p alpha p beta is related to w2. And, in the Parton model, W1 is given in terms of this function f of x and W2 also is given in terms of this function f of x. Which means that in the Parton model, the two functions W1 and W2 are related. So, the prediction if the charge partons are spin zero, then there is no G alpha beta term, which means that Or I, by the way, the notation I am afraid the W1 and W2 are considered functions of Q squared and nu, but when we change the variables to X and Q square, we change the notation from W1 to F1. But f1 is proportional to w1, so if w1 is 0, f1 is 0, whereas if partons are spin half, then there is a relation between w1 and w2 and in fact, we 
given the definitions of f1 and f2 which include these kinematical factors mu and m i can write the relation for w1 and w2 but that involves these extra kinematical factors that's why things are written in terms of f1 and you can look up the details in cheng and li the relation between f1 and f2 turns out to be f1 of x is equal to let me make sure i'm writing this correctly no other other way 2f2 yeah the coefficient of g alpha beta is related to f1 and coefficient of p alpha p beta is related to f2 and we see that f f1 is proportional to f of x f2 is proportional to x times f of x which means that f2 should be proportional to x times f1 of x and if you put in all the kinematic factors etc you get this extra factor of 2 and this is one of the most important relations in this parton physics and it is called callan gross relation and experimentally we find that callan gross relation is correct which means that the partons at least the partons which are taking part in deep inelastic scattering electron deep inelastic scattering those partons have spin half so the experimental verification of callan gross equation is the proof that the charged partons or spin half particles yeah uh, i mean it's f1 is not directly electric charge distribution but uh, yeah i mean it basically it's more of magnetic distribution see the this is one of the big things about dirac equation dirac assumed that there is an electric there is a point uh, point <coughs> electric charge a particle with point like particle with electric charge and dirac equation predicted that it automatically behaves like a magnetic dipole it has a natural intrinsic magnetic moment but that is not true if that point like particle has spin zero there is no intrinsic magnetic moment so in that sense this f1 is related to the magnetic moment uh, of the particle okay by the way Uh, there is this whole thing 
is quite weird. In particular, the justification as to how we can ignore the interaction between the power forms. There is no justification given at all. But there is a picture which says infinite momentum frame. So in the lock frame, the proton is sitting at rest and the electron with a high energy coming and hitting that proton. But you imagine a situation where the electron is at rest and the proton comes with a huge momentum and hits the electron. And if you consider such a frame, this part on picture begins to make sense. Not at least in my mind, not complete sense, but it is more believable in such a frame than in the lat frame. But I am not going into the details of that. Instead, I, I mentioned that infinite momentum frame for a particular reason. Uh, now we start discussing something called So, I hope you have studied Gelman's Quartz model in your particle physics course. There, you say that proton is made up of three quarks and two up quarks, each with charge two thirds, and a down quark with charge minus one third. And neutron is made up of two down quarks and one up quark. Now, this is, this doesn't give us anything. Instead of having proton and neutron, you are saying there are up quark and down quark and you are adjusting the charges of up quark and down quark so that proton charge comes out right, neutron charge comes out right. You are replacing two objects by two other objects. So, there is no simplification there. But, now you assume that a quark and down quark have the same mass equal to one third of the proton mass and calculate the magnetic moment of the proton to be the coherent sum of the magnetic moments of these three quarks. And you do the same thing with neutron and you find that you get the correct prediction for the magnetic moment of proton and magnetic moment of neutron. So now you got four things out of two inputs. You got see you matching proton mass, neutron mass, proton charge at neutron charge. You are not gaining anything. You have, in order to get proton charge, neutron charge, proton mass, neutron mass, you have made an assumption about up quark charge, down quark charge, up quark mass and down quark mass. But having done that, now you are getting two extra pieces of information. Rather, you are getting two predictions. Prediction for proton magnetic moment, prediction for neutron magnetic moment which match the experiment. So that is why we believe in Gelman's quark mode that okay, there is some substance there. Also there are other particles, other composite particles. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I mean there is more to Gelman's quark model than what I have described, I agree. But I mean, let's say I don't care about strange particles, I care only about proton and neutron. Why should I believe in Gelman's quark model? Well, that's the question I tried to answer. That 
I have six pieces of data proton charge, neutron charge, proton mass, neutron mass, proton magnetic moment, neutron magnetic moment. These six pieces of data I am able to explain in terms of four inputs. So yes, there is some substance there. The model has a predictive power. So I take it seriously. But this Gelman quark model is valid when the quarks are sort of sitting at rest. I am taking the quark mass to be one third the proton mass. So it is a static model. But just now I said this parton model makes sense in this infinite momentum frame, the, fr the frame in which the proton is moving with very large momentum. So kinematically quark model is applicable in one place whereas the parton model is applicable in a different place. And the only reason to talk about quark mod parton model is Quarks are constituents of proton, partons are constituents of proton. So why not identify the two of them and ignore the fact that quark mo model is valid in the static limit and parton model is valid in the infinite frame limit, mom infinite momentum frame limit. I didn't understand why the quark model is valid only in this static uh, slow moving. Um, no, no, no. What I mean to say is uh, the you are, okay. I, I should uh, uh, that's a valid question. I should answer it in a better way. In the quark model, I am probing the proton to measure its magnetic moment. But the probe I use is a magnetic field and if you try to think of magnetic field in the quantum field theory sense, the photons you are using are q square very close to zero. Whereas in deep and elastic scattering, we are using as probes photons with q square of the order of GeV square or more. So the probes that we are using to justify quark model and the probes that we are using to justify parton model kinematically they have they are so wide apart that strictly speaking putting the two ideas at least to me doesn't make sense however there is this joke that uh, you are walking along a street and you found that you have lost your purse. Where do you search? You search under a street light. Why do you search there? Well, that is where the light is. You will, you will at least may only if you are 100% sure that the, your purse is not within the light scattered by the street light, then you will try to look where. So we apply essentially the same idea here. Say that, okay, these two ideas, they are really applicable at very wide kinematical situations. But let's put them together and see where it takes us. If it gives some sensible results, we will push it further. If it gives nonsensical results, we will drop. 
So, with that philosophy, let us proceed. By the way, uh, both Feynman and Gelman, they were professors at Caltech. In fact, had offices next to each other and the same secretary worked for both of them. And for a while, they were great friends. They would discuss all ideas thoroughly with each other and there is this the V minus A theory was also there. Feynman and Gelman proposed together independently of uh, Sudarshan and Marsha. But I am afraid this quark partner model sort of led to some kind of fight between them and both of them hated it because as I told you quark model is applicable in uh, one kinematical regime and parton model is applicable in other kinematical regime and they didn't like this mixing up. I believe Feynman used to call quarks as quark quarks that is Q U I R K and uh, Gelman used to call partons as photons but uh, that is their fight for the rest of the physics community. Idea is to sort of try to make a further progress and people took the point of view. Let's put these two things together and see where it takes us. And, uh, and it has led to, and by the way, I should also mention Around the same time, quantum chromodynamics was developed independently as a possible gauge theory of strong interactions. And uh, the combination of this quark parton model plus QCD led to some very impressive successes, and that's why we believe in these things. By the way, I should also mention that uh, this business of combining the quark parton model with QCD was done. One of the papers which applied QCD to the quark parton model and made some important predictions which were later verified was written by Alterelli and Parisi. But later people showed that there are some Russians who had essentially the same ideas of Alterelli Parisi but before QCD. So nowadays this goes under the name Doc Schitzer, Gribov, Lipatov, Alterelli, Parisi. And I am mentioning this because two days ago it was announced that half the Nobel Prize in Physics is given to Parisi. Not for this work, soon after this, Parisi is a field theorist who applied field theory techniques to a number of problems. But later, he applied, he studied what are called complex phenomena and it is for his study of complex phenomena the Nobel Prize was announced. But uh, if you look up Parisi's uh, publication record, you find that this paper has 10,000 citations whereas all other works have maybe a few thousand citations. So in some sense this is Parisi's uh, best known work. So, what is this quark parton model? By the way, I have a online meeting at 11.30, so fine. I am afraid I will not finish. My original idea is to finish the discussion of quark parton model. 
but uh, I won't be able, I have to finish, stop in 10 minutes, but I think maybe I'll stop here now. The details of quark parton model I will discuss in the next class. Okay, uh, let me stop now and uh, if you have some doubts, let us discuss it because I have to attend an online, I have to go home and attend an online meeting at 11.30. This uh, yeah. quark model, we say that there are three quarks in a proton. Mm. And somehow when we go to parton model, it seems that the number is more. Yeah, I agree. So, so, so the, the quark parton model is constructed in such a way that these seemingly contradictory thing, you can make sense. I, I, I will discuss all that. So basically, I introduced that arbitrary function small f of x. So I will introduce now two such functions u of x and d of x. And uh, based on that, and I will I will assume u of x has necessary properties so that in the small q square limit it will appear as if there are two u quarks in the proton and one d quark in the proton and similarly for the neutron. The chargeless protons, yeah. what are they? Okay. I'm okay. I give this is giving a preview of the next lecture. So, if I this is in fact one of the most important results of the quark parton model, it goes under the name momentum sum rule. So, if I build up this picture of quark parton model. Then I make a prediction about the momentum that is carried by the u quarks and the d quarks. Now I can relate that momentum carried by u quarks and d quarks, which is an abstract definition. I can relate it to an experimentally measurable quantity, which is that F2. So the prediction is that this F2 should be some, some quantity made up of that F2 should be 0.55. That is the prediction of the quark parton model under the assumption that partons, these u and d quarks are carrying all the momentum. But experimental measurement shows that the value is half of that. So this we interpret by saying that only half the momentum of the proton is carried by charged partons and the other half of the momentum is carried by neutral partons. And I am saying that the whole picture begins to make more and more sense if you include it with QCD. And QCD says that there are quarks and there are gluons. And gluons have to be chargeless. They should not have any electrical charge. So in that sense, we interpret this violation of momentum sum rule by saying that half the momentum of the quarks, a half the momentum of the proton is carried by quark, uh, by gluons. So when at rest, there are gluons? Yeah, there. So, I mean, this whole thing answers some questions and doesn't answer some other questions. It's a frame changing. Yeah, so, I mean, how do you view a proton at rest? 
is a as far as i see it's a difficult question and that is what this lattice qcd tries to answer but uh, most of the successes in lattice qcd they come in explaining the meson physics as far as i know a satisfactory picture of a proton is still not there in lattice qcd but i could be wrong but that's the impression i have whereas lattice qcd explains the pion mass kon mass etc or the in meson physics they have had great success but meson is a simpler system it has only q q bar whereas the proton and neutron with the three particles it's a more complicated system the part identity of the partons with the gluons the mm. invisible partons with gluons mm. is there some tradition like those invisible things have to be a vector particle is there something like that mm, no <laughs> mean there are predictions related to proton spin but uh, that's a different story and in fact that there is something called proton spin problem and people are still working on it and of course uh, one is there is some something called electron ion collider which is being proposed and it is supposed to study part of the motivation for it is to study that uh, proton spin problem okay i will stop now because i have to go home हाँ इन डी पी इलास्टिक सेटिंग या इज़ इट द हाई क्यू स्क्वायर ऑफ़ द वर्चुअल फोटॉन दैट ब्रेक्स द प्रोटॉन या और इज़ इट द फाइनल मोमेंटम ऑफ़ द पार्टॉन नहीं नहीं इट इज़ द हाई क्यू स्क्वायर ऑफ़ द वर्चुअल फोटॉन व्हिच इज़ पुशिंग द पार्टॉन आउट फ्रॉम द प्रोटॉन at least that's how i picture it i mean something is pushing the parton out of the proton what can it be it is the high q high q square of the virtual photon or if you want in classical picture the electron comes so close to the parton let's say 1/10th of a fermi and exerts such a force on the parton that whatever force is holding the parton inside the proton this force is larger and hence it's like ionization of an atom the coulomb force of the nucleus is holding the electron to the atom but if you if you put an external electric field which can which is larger than that it will pull the electron out and ionizes the atom 